Hello and welcome to our program. I'm Larry Wessels with Christian Answers. I want to thank you for joining us today. Today we're in the middle of a, a long and extensive series dealing with the subject of answering Islamic apologists. Now, a lot of you may not understand what the word apologist is, but an apologist is not someone who apologizes for something. It's someone who uh, makes a stand for their religious faith. They argue why that religious faith is true. They give reasons for it. They give evidences and facts that they think uh, support their arguments. And uh, they also defend their faith from attacks against their religion and give reasoned uh, defenses of their uh, of their uh, position and why their religion is true. So that's what an apologist is, and you can have different types. There's a lot of Christian apologists who follow Jude chapter 3, which says, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Also following what Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 7 and 17, to be set for the defense and faith, for, for the defense and confirmation of the faith. So, uh, biblically or from an Islamic perspective, there are people who defend their prospective religions and argue why their position is true. Well, in this series, we're going to deal with answering Islamic apologists. And our main focus in this series, and this is show number seven now, uh, we have six other hours already committed to uh, dealing with this. And we've been mainly dealing, our main focus is dealing with this Islamic apologist named Dr. Jamal Badawi from his tape series on Islamic teachings. Uh, this is from his package nine now. We've already gone through two of his other packages, but this particular package is entitled uh, Series K, Jesus, Beloved Messenger of Allah, Part 2. And, of course, this is coming from the Islamic Information Foundation out of Canada. And, of course, uh, Dr. Badawi, in this particular set, has done 16 hours of television shows, and these are the audio cassette soundtracks from the television broadcasts that he has made that has gone out to untold thousands of people and on these tapes he makes certain claims and 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 facts that he says are, are true that that relate to his position in Islam and we're going to uh, from a Christian perspective try to answer some of the uh, arguments some of the claims he makes on these tapes for the benefit of our viewers and our fellow Christians so uh, with that I'll put Dr. Badawi over here to the side Badawi, Dr. Badawi will stay right over there. And joining me in this analysis of Dr. Badawi's apologetics is our Director of Research for Christian Answers, Steve Morrison. Steve, great to have you here, brother. Thanks, Larry. Here we go again. We're going to go to tape number one. I'll just start reading the points that come off uh, this first tape. It's entitled, Later Unitarians, Part 7, William Channing and Trinity, Atonement and Blood Sacrifice, The Question of the Trinity. Point one, Badawi once again praises another individual who attacks the Trinity. B, Badawi says the doctrine of the Trinity came from Gnostic and Oriental philosophy. C, Badawi does not like the Athanasian Creed at all. D, Badawi says that all the evidences that people present to prove the deification of Jesus are inconclusive and very weak and misinterpreted within the context of the whole Bible and in fact are simply allegorical. E, 1 John 5, 7 was dropped, showing the Trinity is not true. F. There is no support of the doctrine of the Trinity in the Bible. Just the absolute oneness of God is supported. And G. The doctrine of the Trinity is not logical or reasonable. And then I have a couple of interesting notes here for your uh, consideration. Battleway quotes Channing and other Unitarians and their quoting the Bible passages to attack the Trinity. But at the same time, Battleway attacks Bible passages such as John 1.1 1, 1 and verse 14 and Philippians chapter 2, etc., that he does not like, and their authors, such as John and Paul. Also, on this tape, Badawi has real trouble explaining away the triple point of water, and the listeners should find his arguments here to be very weak and inconclusive, as he would argue. And I mentioned that before in our previous uh, analysis of his uh, other tape series. So here we have uh, a new set of tapes. I would like to mention... And uh, y'all can read along with it at home. And our, one of our uh, newsletters that we put out was called Testimony to the Eternal Godhood, the Trinity. And in here, we uh, put back in 
In fact, this is on a page where Steve's article on uh, the uh, seven simple facts about the Trinity. There's Steve there. But down here in the corner, we got the, we got the Athanasian Creed. And uh, for those at home, I'm going to just read it real quick. We worship one God and Trinity, and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhood of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is all one. The glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such as the Son, and such as the Holy Ghost. The Father is eternal, the Son eternal, and the Holy Ghost eternal. So likewise, the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, and the Holy Ghost almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. And yet, there are not three gods, but one God. The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The Son is of the Father alone, not made nor created, but begotten. The Holy Ghost is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. And in this trinity, none is a fore or after other, none is greater or less than another, but the whole three persons are co-eternal together and co-equal, so that in all things, as is aforesaid, the unity and trinity and the trinity in unity is to be worshipped. He, therefore, that will be saved must thus think of the trinity. And we give the references there for it. But this doctrine right here, given in the Athanasian Creed, is hated. I, to use that term, I don't know, it might, there might be a stronger term, but I know mm -hmm. Badawi hates the Athanasian Creed and the doctrine of the Trinity and goes way out of his way to attack that doctrine. And so for the sake of the viewers who weren't aware of the Athanasian Creed, you just heard it for yourself, saw the reference, and he claims all this comes from Oriental and Greek philosophy. Badawi praises individuals who attack the Trinity. Badawi will use anyone Unitarians, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Armstrongites, etc., who attack essential Christian doctrine, even when those he quotes would disagree with Badawi's own Islamic religion and interpretations. This is clearly an example of selective citation. Following the old adage, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. The claim that early Christianity was influenced by Gnosticism goes back at least as far as Richard Reitzenstein in the first half of the 20th century. While the early church fathers depicted Gnosticism as a Christian heresy, Reitzenstein believed that it was actually a pre-Christian movement that in several important ways influenced early Christianity, including the Pauline and Johannine views of Jesus. Closer to our own time, Rudolf Boltmann extended Reitzenstein's position, making it an important part of his interpretation of John's Gospel. Even while the theory of an early Christian dependence on Gnosticism remained largely in disfavor among biblical scholars, it, like other claims of syncretism, continued to be propagated both in popular writings and in textbooks written by specialists in areas other than theology. Gnosticism was not a monolithic religion. The term is used to refer to a wide variety of religious views and movements that became influential during the first several centuries A.D. Gnosticism may well be the epitome Hellenistic syncretism, drawing from and blending together philosophical ideas from Platonism, Stoicism, and religious ideas from Jewish, Babylonian, Egyptian, and other Middle Eastern traditions. In addition to the heretical versions of the Christian Gnosticism that are known about from the Church Fathers, there seem to have been several non-Christian movements that some call Gnostic and others describe as semi-Gnostic. One example of a broad definition of Gnosticism explains it as a religious movement in which salvation depends on knowledge. Anyone accepting this broad a definition will have no difficulty finding Gnosticism practically anywhere in the Hellenistic world. Advocates of a more narrow definition limit the essence of Gnosticism by pointing out that the system is basically dualistic, 
that it contains a myth of a descending and ascending Redeemer, and so on. One real problem in any attempt to unravel the various threads of the Gnostic problem is the inability of scholars to agree on a definition. Questions to ask concerning skeptics' claims about Christian dependence on Gnostic and Oriental philosophy. What is the evidence for the claim or theory? What are the dates for the evidence? Is the evidence pre- or post-Christian? How was the alleged date determined? Do any scholars disagree with the dating? What literature, pro or con, has already been published about this theory? Is the language used to describe the evidence faithful to the original source material? Or does it include interpretive materials such as Christian language, themes, or imagery? Are the alleged parallels really similar? Or are the likenesses a result of either exaggeration, oversimplification, inattention to detail, or, once again, the use of Christian language in the description? In the case of any genuine parallel, is the point of analogy significant? Does it relate to an essential Christian belief or practice? Or does it refer to something incidental, such as the late Christian adoption of December 25th as the date of Christ's birth? Is the parallel the same sort of thing that could have arisen independently in several different movements? For example, could it have arisen from common language? Is the claim consistent with the historical information we have about the first century church? Does the fact that some New Testament writers knew of a pagan belief or term prove that what he knew had a formative or genetic influence on his own essential beliefs? Is it not possible that a writer could have a missionary motive? People who are witnessing to pagans find it helpful to present their message in ways that will get the attention of their audience and then communicate with them in language that they will understand? The Christian church and its doctrine is built on the fact of Christ's gospel and his historical resurrection, not on claims and theories of unbelieving skeptics. Skeptics take factual Christian doctrine and try to make mythical inventions out of them to suit their own imaginary theories. Was early Christianity a syncretistic faith? Did it borrow any of its essential beliefs and practices either from Hellenistic philosophy or religion or from Gnosticism? The evidence requires that these questions be answered in the negative. The source for this material is from Nash, the Gospel, and the Greeks, PNR Publishing, 2003, pages 191 through 192, pages 200 to 202, and pages 250 through 254. Badawi's claim that the Trinity came from the Gnostics cannot be historically or theologically verified. Badawi ignores the fact that there is much evidence that Islam borrowed from Zoroastrianism and other Oriental religions. The Athanasian Nicene Creed. Badawi does not like any Christian creeds, not just this one. Quote, we worship one God and Trinity, and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. But the whole three persons are co-eternal together and co-equal. The unity in Trinity and the Trinity in unity is to be worshipped. He, therefore, that will be saved must thus think of the Trinity. Source, Silopedia of Biblical Theology, New York, 1871. As pointed out in the last series, out of one side of his mouth, Badawi says there is no evidence in the New Testament for the deity of Christ. Out of the other side of his mouth, Badawi castigates Paul, such as Philippians, etc., and the gospel writers in Matthew and John for teaching the deity of Christ. Badawi's point 1e about 1 John 5-7, Badawi repeats his point about this verse in series 8, 
tape 10A of his tape album. 1 John 5, 7 explicitly mentions the Trinity. There is no evidence that this verse was dropped, to quote it from Badawi, from the original. Rather, this verse was added because there is no Bible with this verse in it until the 16th century. Manuscript and historical evidence concerning this verse do not support Badawi's claim about the Trinity being false. No support of the Trinity? This video series has shown repeatedly biblical evidence for the Trinity. Our viewers are invited to review the hours of documented material available throughout this series. Written literature is available upon request. One of our websites is www.biblequery.org for further review. And I will go immediately to tape number two in this package, read you the points that Dr. Badawi is making here, and then Stephen and myself will analyze that and move on to his next tape. So, tape two, Trinity, Atonement, and Blood Sacrifice, two and three. Point A, Badawi quotes the Quran, which says Jesus is not God, in Surah 575. B, Badawi quotes Surahs 4, 171, and Surah 576 in the Quran, which says there is no trinity. C, Badawi says the Holy Spirit is the angel Gabriel, not God. D, Badawi says Islam is a very clear, quote, negation, end quote, of trinity, Jesus' atonement, and Christ's blood sacrifice. E. Badawi says you can be a good Christian without believing in the Trinity, Christ's atonement by his blood sacrifice on the cross, or other distorted teachings given by an unreliable Bible based on faulty gospel records. F. Badawi says Jesus never taught the idea of substitutionary blood atonement but rather keeping the Ten Commandments and doing good works, according to Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 19. Okay, so looking at these, th this list here, uh, I don't think I'll argue with Dr. Badawi here at all from what the Quran says about Jesus not being God. In fact, uh, I have my Quran right here. Uh, it, he quotes these passages about Jesus not being God in Surah 5, it also says uh, there is no trinity, and uh, of course Muhammad in the Quran says that uh, it's blasphemy to believe in uh, God having partners, and he lists an idea of this trinity like the Christians would have. And so from a Muslim, Islamic, Quranic perspective, believing that Jesus is God, believing that, uh, uh, that uh, he died on a cross, believing in this trinity, all that's considered blasphemy. Uh, by the Prophet Muhammad and uh, Islamic teachings. And, 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 and Christians, to use an Islamic term, would say that is all innovation, and Muhammad is actually the innovator. Yeah, that's true. Now, let's, let's look at uh, Surah uh, 9 here. I'm looking at Surah 930, and it says, The Jews call Uzair a son of God, and the Christians call Christ the son of God. This is a saying from their mouth. In this, they but imitate what the unbelievers of old used to say God's curse be upon them how they are deluded away from the truth and then uh, it just goes on to say more about this in the sense that uh, verse 31 they say they take their priests and their authorities to be their lords and uh, derogation of God and they take as their Lord Christ the son of Mary Yet they are commanded to worship but one God. There is no God but he. Praise and glory to him. Far is he from having the partners they associate with him. And this couldn't be more clear from Muhammad himself from the Quran. I've got a Yusuf Ali translation, 1977 here. This is from page 448. But anyway, right there, he's, he's saying that uh, they call Christ the Son of God. And uh, they have these 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 basically uh, blasphemies in their, in their mouth and they're deluded and uh, they associate partners with God. All these things uh, uh, Muhammad says are wrong. But the main things he's saying here about this is that they have God's curse. He says, God's curse be upon them. How they are deluded away from the truth. And of course, Dr. Badawi in his arguments is following what Muhammad tells him in the Quran, that the Christians are deluded. 
Right. Uh, don't forget the Jews here, the slander against the Jews. It, it says here that the Jews um, called Uzer, which is Ezra in, in, in the Bible. Oh, that's they call right. It, 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 uh, Ezra, son of God. All right, well, Jews did not call Ezra the, the, the son of God. Um, there was one Muslim guy who said, well, you know, maybe there was, well, he said there was, there was a group of Jews around uh, Mecca that did that, but it's like there is no evidence except that this guy just made this up. It's sort of like, well, if the Quran says that there were Jews that, that Jews did that, then there must have been some Jews did that. But it, but if you can't find any evidence, then then it's it's um, not honest to say, well, because I think there were some, therefore there were some, therefore that backs up the Quran. That's right. In, in fact, uh, what he's saying there, Muhammad, and you brought the good point. He's basically cursing both the Jews and the Christians. Right. They, 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 is this some of the beauty of the Quran that battle we talked well, about? Well, I know earlier? in other parts of the Quran it says, "Take not Christians and Jews for your friends." That's right. And when, there's when, many other derogatory things that the Quran says about Christians and Jews. Yeah, and and I have a number of, of Muslim friends that don't follow that verse, and I've I even asked them about that. Uh, you know, we had a fairly close relationship, and they said, "Well, that part was abrogated." Well, I'm I'm glad to hear they think that. <laughs> and and so uh, as we look at this, there's a lot of what Badawi says here is he attacks what the Christians believe. He's taking it straight from he's taking it straight from the Quran, obviously, and when he says things like the Quran is a very clear negation of Christian teachings such as Christ's atonement because the Quran says Jesus did not die on a cross and therefore his blood sacrifice is not necessary. Well, Dr. Badawi is correct from an Islamic perspective because it says right in the Quran these things. I can understand why he would say that, but from a biblical perspective, you know, it's absurd wait, wait, the Bible doesn't say that at all. Yeah, it, it, mm. so, so, so Badawi, it sounds like, would agree with us that the God in the Bible that we have and the God in Islam are different. And a lot of uninformed American, you know, liberals, you know, think they're the same, and even some uninformed Muslims who, you know, think so too. But but Badawi actually is correct; they're not the same. Now, I wouldn't use the word negation here. I would use the word innovation. That that, that the Islam is an innovation um, that denies those things. Sort of like you know the other innovations that say Muhammad is God, uh, mm -hmm. and it's like, well, you know, this is just a, another kind of right. Or, or, because the, the the Quran came uh, six hundred years after the. The life of Christ, right. 600 years later, it's a late innovation that just decided to improvise and come up with some new doctrine, something different. And that's exactly what you get in the Quran, as I read just a few passages to you. Now, one of the things Badawi says on this tape is, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit is the angel Gabriel. And uh, when we look at the scripture, talk about... Talk about innovations. When you look at the scripture, you don't get that the Holy Spirit is the angel Gabriel at all. at all. And in fact, in our previous program, and anyone that wants to write our ministry, we have plenty of written literature on this. All, the Bible verses lined up for you. Plenty of evidence, historical evidence, things of that nature. But uh, just to read a, a few passages here about the, uh, the, the Holy Spirit, uh, in, the, in the scripture you find that the, uh, the, the Holy Spirit has a mind there in Romans 8.27. He's got an infinite, there's the infinite comprehension of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 2, verse 11. You find a foreknowledge of the Spirit in John 16, 13, the power of the Spirit, Romans 15, uh, 13, the love of the Spirit, Romans 15, 30, self-determining will of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 11, that the Holy Spirit creates life and gives life. That's Job 33, 4 and Psalm 33, 6. I don't think the the angel Gabriel can do that. That's no, something that God does. That. God creates. He creates life, not not some uh, uh, angel. Uh, that the Holy Spirit regenerates the soul. That's John chapter three, verses five through eight. Uh, that uh, the Holy Spirit uh, inspired the sacred writers of the gospel records in the, the New Testament. That's Second Peter. Uh, chapter 1, verse 21. And I could go on and on and on with uh, all these attributes of the Holy Spirit, of which Acts chapter 5 says that the Holy Spirit is God. It's just one reference, by the way. You get many of the doxologies given in many of the epistles by the Apostle Paul, for instance, where he blesses the church at the end of his epistle and, and says in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, you know, are the blessings of them. And you also get that in Jesus' uh, 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 command of baptism, Matthew 28, 19, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Why would Jesus say to baptize somebody in the name of this angel Gabriel. Right. Uh, and in all these other places, uh, 
There's no way you can construe the fact from, and there's many, many, many more verses I could read. I, I haven't even started to read them. There's just too many for the TV show. But uh, there's no way you can get an angel Gabriel out of the text of Scripture that we're looking at right, here. Right, right. One other thing, though, is that regardless of who the Holy Spirit is, if the Holy Spirit glorified Jesus, then shouldn't you glorify Jesus? In John 14.25, it says, 14.26, it says, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, uh, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I said to you. So the Holy Spirit is the same as the Counselor. And then in John uh, 16, uh, it, uh, it, uh, verse 14, it's, it's talking about the Counselor here, and it says, He will bring glory to me, Jesus is speaking, by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. So the Holy Spirit brings glory to Jesus. Okay, so... If he brings glory to Jesus, then shouldn't you glorify Jesus too? Amen. That's what it, you're supposed to be doing according to what the Bible says. But uh, like I said, and I like what you've said here, this, this Islamic innovation of coming up with these new doctrines and denying everything that's historically before it and verified by history, archaeology, prophetic utterances, uh, early church fathers, uh, this innovation of Muhammad uh, uh, you know, denies and cuts across all that. Well, let's uh, quickly answer a couple of other points and we as we move on. He brought up how uh, uh, you, you can still be a good Christian by not believing in the Trinity, not believing that Christ's blood sacrifice was made for you, not believing uh, any of these other doctrines, that Jesus died on the cross. You can still be a good Christian if, uh, by not believing in any of that stuff. What, what, well, that goes directly contradictory to the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1, uh, but, uh, 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 Paul talks about now, uh, these are the primary things of, of first importance, that Christ died for his sins according to the Scriptures and he was raised according to the Scriptures. And if you don't believe these things, and Paul says, you believe in vain. And you will die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I think it, it, it is not accurate, but it's more accurate to say, you can be a good Muslim and worship Ali and Solomon al-Farisi, like the Alawites do. That's more accurate to say that than it is to say you can be a good Christian and not believe in, in, in Jesus dying on the cross and resurrection. Yeah, though, what, though, of course, neither one is accurate. In fact, what's the point of being uh, calling yourself a Christian when you don't believe anything that the Christian religion teaches or, <laughs> or yeah. purports to believe and holds as essential? I mean, to me, it's, <clears throat> it's ridiculous. Uh, it's sort of like, uh, let's say there's a, a club in town called, uh, I don't know, just call it any name you want to call it, Jack's Club. And... Uh, Jack has a set of rules, you know, never wear tennis shoes, never, uh, never eat uh, fish on Wednesday, something like that. Well, let's say I call myself, well, I'm a member of Jack's club. And they say, well, do you follow the rules? I say, no. Uh, you know, have you ever been to Jack's club? Well, no. You know, why are you saying you're a member of Jack's club? Well, uh, you know, it just seemed to be in vogue or something. It seemed like something I just wanted to do. Well, people just... You know, you can't really say you're a Christian if you deny everything the Christian faith says. It's, or, like, I think Dr. Badawi would agree, he would call a lot of these people that say they're Muslims, and he would say they're not really Muslims. They're mm -hmm. really kafir because they don't do what Muhammad says. They don't do what the Quran says. They don't believe what he says. They don't believe what Quran... I mean, take the black Muslims, for instance, with Louis Farrakhan and stuff. Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam uh, believe in 12 black gods. And this was part of the creation. See, Badawi would say that's blasphemy to believe in multiple gods and all right. this kind of stuff. He would not even yet they call themselves black Muslims. Yeah, and, he would and, never accept them. And, and by the one thing about black Muslims is that recently I read they've had sort of a reapproachment with mainstream Islam to where maybe they've dropped some of these teachings. But what Larry says, you know, the black Muslims are still caught red-handed because this is what they used to teach and used to believe. Right now, uh, just uh, just for the point of the sake of the viewers. Can you find a Bible verse that says that Jesus' blood atones for sin? Or is that something that's um, just uh, made up by Christians? Matthew and Greek twenty twenty eight. Jesus himself, you know, on, uh, uh, the Son of Man came not to, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. All throughout the uh, uh, Hebrews, it talks about the blood of Christ. In Revelation, they're covered with the blood of Christ. Um, uh, John the Baptist, uh, who is an honor, who is a prophet according to Islam, also uh, said that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, we could go, we 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 could go on on and on. Uh, it, it's all over the New Testament. You you basically would have to deny every single book of the Bible if you said that wasn't in the Bible. And I think this is why Doctor Badawi goes out of his way to attack the Bible mm -hmm. because it's so different 
than what Islam teaches in Quran right. and what Muhammad teaches in his in his word. One last point here. Uh, what about uh, Steve? I'll ask you this, and the viewers at home. Doctor Badawi is saying that you're not supposed to worry about some blood sacrifice for your sins by Jesus. That the real way of salvation is to is to do works righteousness. You know, as long as you do more good works than bad works, basically, uh, just by doing good works is the way to get yourself saved. You earn it by getting, you know, pulling up uh, in, in your shirt sleeve and pulling up yourself by your bootstraps and get out there and do some good works, and you can get your salvation that way. You don't need Jesus or His cross. What do you have to say? All right, we that? have fourteen hundred years of God guiding the people of Israel. Uh, the denies what what Badawi said is that ever you know for fourteen hundred years from the time of Moses and actually even earlier with the time of Abraham they had sacrifices to God but from especially from the time of Moses when they set up all the sacrifices there are, you know an entire book of the Bible just about uh, the, the book of Leviticus which can be thought of a book of holiness. Uh, shows just the importance of sacrifices. Now, why would God have them do all these sacrifices? Well, the answer is fa fairly simple. He wanted them to be so ingrained in their culture that the understanding of the need for a sacrifice for forgiveness and that they would have this blood atonement through these animals. Uh, and, of course, they do it over and over. It didn't actually forgive the sin, but it covered over the sin and, and, and connected with the one true sacrifice of Jesus Christ uh, who who is the sacrifice for us? And so you know, I said, well, do Christians still do, do have blood sacrifices today? Well, in one sense, yes, but we didn't do them, and it was done for us by Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ actually just did it once and for all, according to Hebrews. So he's, so, and once he did it once, he doesn't have to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So we don't say that the blood sacrifices were abrogated. Uh, actually, uh, we say that the blood sacrifices were fulfilled once and for all through Jesus. Especially uh, when you look at uh, Hebrews chapter 7 through chapter 9 right. in the Bible, it's so clear on this whole situation of uh, the sacrifice and the, 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 the blood of bulls and goats were not able to, to accomplish the overall atonement for sin, but Christ's blood was. And uh, he sat down on the, the right hand of God. Uh, unlike the priest who had to stand up continually offering sacrifices. But when Jesus sat down, that shows that he has completed it. He has Finality. paid it. He is, it's, it's final. It's finished. It is finished. And uh, one last point I'll bring up. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, just I mean, it's a famous passage. Most people know it. But it's Ephesians 2, 8 through uh, 10. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So we are saved by grace through faith and not by works. But once we're born again and we're filled with the Holy Spirit, as the scripture talks about, we have that love for God and we do good works for God because we love God. Not to do works to get saved. See, the Muslims have it totally turned around, especially Dr. Badawi. They're trying to do all these works to get in favor with God, to get saved, to go to paradise. Whereas we as Christians, we are saved by faith uh, and not of works. We are saved by the grace and love of God because of his mercy towards us. And once we have the gift of the Holy Spirit, as the scripture talks about, and also Jesus in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8, uh, well, we have that natural love for God. We have that communion God. We have that relationship with God. And we do works unto God. We're made, you know... Uh, out of gratitude. Out of gratitude. We, 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 we're, we're His workmanship, the scripture said. We, we, out of gratitude and His workmanship, we want to do good works unto Him. Because we love him. It's just like when our daddy, who we love, asks us to do something. And we, sure, we say, sure, daddy, I'll go do it for you. You know, and, uh, you, know you like to do things for your parents now and then. Because, and it's not that you want to do those things for your parents because, well, if I don't do it, I'm not gonna, he's going he's gonna, uh, uh, he's, he's to disassociate himself with me. He's going to cast me out of the family. He, uh, he's going to throw me out of the house. No, we do good works for our parents because we love our parents. And see... The other way, uh, you almost look at this Allah that says you've got to do these good works, and if you don't, well, you're out. You know? mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, let's move on. We're, uh, uh, that was important to cover, but we're going to have to uh, cover more ground here. Let's see, uh, tape three, sin and atonement. A, Badawi says the main proponent of the theory of blood and sacrifice and atonement in the New Testament was Paul 
who was not a disciple of Jesus or even an eyewitness of the ministry of Jesus. But he was an eyewitness of Jesus on the way to Damascus. Though. Right, according to the Bible, Acts chapter 5, or Acts chapter 9, I'm sorry. Okay, B, uh, Paul was uh, more explicit in his writings about blood sacrifice and atonement than the other writers of the New Testament. C, Battleway quotes John 17, 4 and says that this shows Jesus completed his mission even before any blood atonement was done, and that it is solid proof that no crucifixion was necessary. D. James differed with Paul on atonement and faith, chapter 2. Particularly, uh, I know about always going to James 2.24, and of course I've got it here in the notes too. And uh, stress keeping the law and doing works. Battleway pits James 2.24 versus Paul in Galatians 2.16. E. Paul assumed human nature, Romans 5.18, was corrupt because of Adam's fall into sin. Also, Romans 5, 12. F, Badawi says it is not uh, just to condemn people in advance, referring to the previous section on Paul there in the human nature. G, Badawi asks how can God be just if he created man imperfectly and then requires us to be perfect in our lives when God knows we are not perfect. H, Badawi says it is not just for an innocent man like Jesus to die uh, for the wicked and guilty. Badawi says... Uh, it is of itself, it is cruel and unjust for an innocent man to die for the guilty. And it's, it's not enough, he says basically there. It's just not enough for an innocent man to die for the wicked and the guilty. I, Badawi asks, wouldn't it be more just to forgive the sincere, repentant person seeking forgiveness than requiring a blood sacrifice for that forgiveness? J, Badawi says the Pauline theory of atonement, which was introduced after the ministry of Jesus, is not consistent with either the divine qualities of God, justice, or mercy. K, Paul's idea of atonement does not work because you do not sacrifice something superior or something inferior for something inferior. It is always the other way around. L, Badawi says it's morally wrong to commit suicide, so therefore Jesus would have been morally wrong to be willing to die for sins. M, Badawi asks, who died on the cross? Was it God or man? Badawi says God cannot die. So it had to be just the man, Jesus, whose death would not be able to die for sins. That was a lot of points, but we got them all in there. Paul on atonement and blood sacrifice. We can agree with part of what Dr. Badawi says. Blood atonement was clearly taught in the New Testament in Paul's letters. Note that Badawi clearly admits blood atonement was taught in the New Testament. Blood atonement can clearly be found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the writings of Peter, and elsewhere in the New Testament. Blood atonement can be found in Isaiah, the writings of the prophet Moses, and other places in the Old Testament. Paul was more explicit than other writers on this. Paul and John were both very explicit, because both explained in detail the blood sacrifice atonement of Christ for sins. The writer of Hebrews was even more explicit. Badawi is simply upset when Bible writers are clear and precise in their doctrine as to make it impossible for heretics to interpret these doctrines in any other way. John 17, 4. Jesus completed his mission before the crucifixion? Badawi contextually misinterprets John 17, 4 to argue that Jesus' mission was complete before his crucifixion. A cursory reading of the New Testament reveals that Jesus' death was necessary for his mission to be complete. Badawi is simply wrong. See Matthew chapter 20 verses 17 through 19, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4, Hebrews chapter 10 verses 1 through 39, Luke chapter 24 verses 13 through 35, etc. James 2.24 and Galatians 2.16 there is no contradiction between James and Paul. Nothing in James denies we are saved by grace through faith. It is not of ourselves. Paul, who said we are saved to do good works in Ephesians, does not deny James too, which said that faith without works is dead. Faith is an input to our salvation, and works are an essential output of that salvation. Once again, Badawi does not take into account the context of what the Bible writers are saying. Paul only assumed human nature was corrupt. Badawi's view here seems at variance with standard Sunni theology. 
While Sunni Islam does not stress the sinfulness of man as much as Christianity, it does acknowledge that all but Jesus were touched by Satan in the womb. See Sahith al-Bakari, Volume 4, 506. Not just to condemn people in advance? Badawi misses the point of a key Christian doctrine here. The Bible clearly teaches that mankind has a sinful nature from Adam, Romans 5, verses 12 through 21. And therefore, God would be just if he sent everyone to hell. However, God has not elected to do so. Praise God for his mercy and grace. The justice of God? Perhaps an analogy will help here. If people were involuntarily placed on a sinking ship, they might not be responsible for their own death if they drowned. However, if they were told to leave the ship and get on the waiting lifeboat, and they rejected the offer, then their death would be solely their own fault. The Old Testament prophet Ezekiel says as much in Ezekiel 33, verses 1 through 9. Unjust for Jesus to die for the guilty? Badawi unjustly misses the point in the unjust death of Jesus on the cross. Jesus did not deserve to die, but willfully chose the nails. He deliberately chose to be a victim of injustice for our sake to satisfy the righteous and holy justice of God against sin. It is God who makes the rules and the laws of justice, not Badawi. Therefore, it was not unjust for God to sacrifice His Son Jesus for the redemption of lost sinners. God calls the shots, not Badawi. More just to not require a blood sacrifice? Badawi has a light concept of the seriousness of sin and the justice of God. God punishes all sin, not just the sin He wants to punish. God, the just judge, fairly punishes our sin through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus willingly came to earth for the purpose of dying to atone for sin to appease the wrath of God in the place of sinners who repent and believe. The Old Testament animal blood sacrifices and ordinances foreshadow the sacrifice of Christ. See Hebrews and the rest of the New Testament. Atonement inconsistent with God, justice, and mercy? Badawi admits that the atonement is clearly taught in the New Testament, at least in Paul's letters. However, Badawi is giving Paul more credit than is due. It is not just Paul, but John, Luke, Matthew, Peter, Jesus, John the Baptist, the Old Testament prophets such as Isaiah, who are declaring this atonement. We have to agree with Badawi to the extent that the consistent message of Jesus, the apostles, and the Old Testament prophets is inconsistent with the nature of the Islamic God named Allah as found in the Quran. Cannot sacrifice the superior for the inferior? Man, who is always looking for a bargain, never knowingly sacrifices something superior for something inferior. However, God's ways are not man's ways. Isaiah 55, 8. God sacrificed Jesus for our sake, and Jesus was superior. However, Badawi, only seeing a horrible, foolish tragedy of the biblical doctrine of the crucifixion, is not seeing the wonderful, triumphant vindication of the death and resurrection of Jesus, which were called for in the plan of God. Acts chapter 2 verses 23 and 24. It is morally wrong to commit suicide? Jesus did not commit suicide because choosing to remain and be martyred is not committing suicide. Jesus was betrayed into the hands of sinners and was murdered by them. How is this considered to be suicide? The Muslim Hadiths teach that one who commits suicide goes to hell. If Badawi believes choosing to remain in a place of certain death is suicide and send someone to hell, would Badawi be willing to say that Hussein, Ali's son, was in hell for refusing to surrender 
against impossible odds? Did God or man die on the cross? Once again, Badawi gives his unfortunate listeners a fallacy in logic known as the complex question. The fallacy of the complex question is simply a question that expects a yes or no or a either or response when in fact the response actually involves several different issues where a yes or no either or is impossible. It is like asking the question, have you stopped beating your wife lately? No matter how the question is answered, the respondent is incriminated. Likewise, if the respondent grants Badawi's illogical question, he will not have a satisfactory answer. The Bible, including Paul, clearly teaches that Jesus was fully God and fully man. Badawi tries to deny the biblical teaching with a faulty question, which does not allow the actual answer to come forward. Why does Badawi do this? Badawi simply does not like the fact that Jesus is both God and man at the same time. The man Jesus died, but his God nature did not. Just as man's spirit lives beyond death, so does Jesus' spirit and nature live beyond his death on the cross. Let's move on to the, uh, the next tape. Next, this will be tape number four, Sin and Atonement. A, Battery rehashes much of what he said on tape three, which we just dealt with. Uh, B, Battery simply does not believe that Paul and the other biblical writers, he simply does not believe what Paul and the other biblical writers say about the atonement of Jesus Christ for sins. C, Battery keeps referring to Paul's innovation and cites particularly Philippians 2 to demonstrate it and attacks the deity of Christ mentioned in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Now, at this point, I've got a, another quote coming from a debate with another Muslim apologist. Uh, this is uh, Hamza Abdul Malik, uh, which we will uh, play in his debate with James White, who you heard earlier already. Uh, but let me play the tape, and then uh, we'll be back. ...of worship anybody other than God. And this is found also in Isaiah chapter 45, verses 22 through uh, 23. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself that the word has gone forth out of my mouth in righteousness and I shall not return. That unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, shall swear. Now, we have a problem here because in Philippians chapter 2 verse 10 it says there that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee shall bow and everything that is in the heaven and the earth and everything that is under the earth. So we have to question Paul. Well, look, Paul, what about this business here now? It says here that every knee shall bow to God. And you're saying here to the Philippians that at the uh, uh, name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. So Paul assures us, he says, look, don't get upset. That was just something for them. Because in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, Paul says, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's who I'm bowing my knees to. I was just fooling around with those Philippians. Okay, so... Uh, the Muslim apologist here, Mr. Malik, says that Paul, and this is going directly from the reference that Badawi gives from Philippians chapter 2, all Paul was really doing there with the Philippians was just fooling around with them a little bit. He, uh, he didn't really mean that. He didn't really mean that he was uh, calling Jesus Christ Lord and every knee should bow to him. So I find that amazing that uh, here, your Muslim apologist, that shows you the degree of respect they have for the Scripture for the writers of Scripture, uh, when they can say that, oh, well, Paul is just fooling around with those Philippians. You know, like, he, it didn't really matter. It didn't matter if he was really telling them any truth or not. But if he's fooling around with them like that, he'd be fooling around people all over the place. And basically, that's what Badawi is saying with, when he keeps saying Paul's bringing in innovations. Because Badawi knows, and so does this Muslim apologist, that Paul is really saying Jesus is God. And every knee should bow to him, every tongue confess. And they realize that, and that's why they don't like these kind of per these verses in the Bible. And they say, they're, oh, well, Paul is just fooling around, or it's not true, or it's an interpolation, or it's an innovation. So with that, let me go on real quick, and then I'm going to let Steve jump in here and, and cover anything he wants to cover. Uh, point D, to attack Jesus' atonement, Badawi indicates that Jesus was a sinner on the same level as other pure human beings. He mentions... Uh, author Dennis Meinhan's book about Jesus being a sinner. E, Badawi says uh, 
Jesus was sinless in a sense, just as all the other prophets, including Muhammad, were sinless in a sense. But Jesus still had to deal with human frailties. Therefore, Jesus was not sinlessly perfect like God is. F. Badawi says that any of the prophets could have done what Jesus did in the wilderness temptation with the devil, Luke 4 and Matthew 4. G. Badawi says Jesus and Muhammad were not as good as God is. H. Since Muhammad was a greater prophet and the last apostle and his blood sacrifice was not necessary, then neither was Jesus' sacrifice. Paul's innovation or God's truth? Again, if Paul, Peter, John, Jesus, and Isaiah all have very similar innovations, then the innovator was the common source for all of these, namely God. Muslim apologists believe anything in the Bible that does not agree with them is an innovation. Jesus sinned also? Against Badawi, we have Muhammad himself. Muhammad said that unlike all other people, Jesus was not touched by Satan in the womb. Viewers are urged to see show number two in this video series entitled Answering Islamic Apologists for a thorough refutation of Badawi's argument that Jesus sinned also. Any prophet could have done what Jesus did in resisting Satan? Muslim sources disagree. They admit the prophet Adam sinned and the prophet Jonah defied God. Once again, see our show number two in this series. Badawi claims Jesus and Muhammad were not as good as God. Jesus was very careful in his use of good, saying, None is good except God alone. Yet in John 10:11, Jesus explicitly called himself the Good Shepherd. Jesus himself said that he was God in John 5:23. John 8, 58, John 10, verses 30 through 33, John 17, 5, etc. Muhammad's blood sacrifice was not necessary, so neither was Jesus's. 1,500 years of Jewish history and the New Testament teach that blood sacrifice was necessary. Muhammad was a false prophet. Therefore, Muhammad's sacrifice would have been worthless in the sight of God. Jesus' sacrifice, however, was accepted by God. See Hebrews chapter 10, etc. I guess Badawi is saying that Muhammad, he's kind of saying Muhammad and Jesus are on the same plane as far as being Although he goes on to say Muhammad was greater, a right. greater prophet so, uh, later. Yeah, so it sounds like Badawi is not really saying Muhammad is sinless in really being without sin either, which go, which actually is not inconsistent with the Quran, but that goes against modern, uh, what the majority of maybe modern Muslims say. So he's kind of deviating from regular Muslims there. The other thing he says that Muhammad was the, the greatest prophet and, and, and he was the last one. Okay, well actually there are you know, a couple hundred million Muslims who disagree with that, Shiites. And looking in the Quran, uh, you know, Orientalists have looked and said, so there's actually nothing in the Quran that says Muhammad was the last apostle. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, it's sort of like Christians, um, you know, we say that the, after Jesus, the only thing that happens after that is that, you know, Jesus comes again. Well, uh, Sunnis would say that nothing happens after Muhammad uh, until the end times. But um, but Shiites would say no. And actually, so so he's kind of different, different, different from the Shiites a little bit here. So... Anyway, that any prophet could have done what Jesus did. Well, a person could resist temptation, but not when you haven't eaten, you know, supernaturally, you know, for 40 days. And that doesn't mean don't eat during the daytime and then eat at night. That well, means I invite our viewers, though, to, to read Matthew chapter 4 and Luke 4. Go ahead. Right. I mean, Satan offered him all the, all the kingdoms of, of, of the world. Uh, you know, Muhammad wanted his followers to take the kingdoms of the world. And, and you know, but uh, he was off that, and Jesus said no. You know, because Jesus would have had to fall down and, and, and worship another, you know, worship Satan, and Jesus refused to do that. So, anyway, uh, Badawi doesn't, to, uh, to me, he's basically, he's not saying that, um, that the Bible teaches something different in this video, he's, is he, he, or, or audio tape. He's saying basically that he doesn't like what the Bible teaches, and of course he's entitled his opinion, but obviously it's very clear with both Badawi and Malik that they do agree that the Bible does 
teach clearly that Jesus is God. Right. That's the funny thing about it. They 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 themselves admit that these teachings about Jesus being God are in the Bible. Right. Yeah, they yeah. just don't want to believe it. Yeah. Now they they may say, oh, the original Bible was different. Or, or or it's been corrupted, but they haven't given any evidence. No evidence corrupted. whatsoever. And in fact, it's like we take this Quran and we find any verse we want. Where, where like here we read earlier, you know, on page four forty eight in the Yusuf Ali translates, Jews and Christians are cursed. Well, Muhammad didn't really mean that. And when he said that a man can have four wives, he didn't really mean that. And, For himself. And and, and to uh, kill kill the pagans, where uh, and slay them wherever you find them. You know, uh, uh, you know crucifixion, execution, all these things that Muhammad talks about with unbelievers and, and kafir. He didn't really mean that. Muhammad was just fooling around with them, their uh, Arabians, you know. Hmm. So he was just, uh, Muhammad was just fooling around in a lot of this stuff that he was saying. And he didn't really mean it. Well, but well, see, that's what we get from Muslim apologists well, well, or, about the Bible. Or they would say, yeah, they would say that it was only for that time and it wasn't for all time. But Muhammad forgot to say that last part. <laughs> Right. A note to remember in dealing with Muslim apologists and their attacks against Christianity, Jesus Christ, and the Bible. The A. Yusuf Ali translation of Surah 354 from the Quran says, quote, The best of planners is God. The Arab word alone means to deceive, plan, plot, or scheme. The true translation includes plotting, scheming, planning because the context is making plans. However, the true translation also includes deceive because Allah deceived because Allah deliberately misled Jews, later Christians, and in the Hadith, Muslims. Will Allah deceive you? The Caliph Abu Bakr once said he was frightful of the mocker, deceitfulness of Allah. According to the Quran, Allah deceived the Jews. According to the Quran, Jesus was not really crucified. Thus, every early Christian writer was deceived by Allah. According to the Hadith, Allah will come in a deceiving shape to all Muslims, and the hypocritical Muslims will be deceived by Allah. As Christians, we believe Surah 354 is correct. The Muslim religion of Allah may be the best deceiver that Satan ever created. Thus Muslim apologists use deceptive arguments to sway their listeners to their cause. Truth becomes the first casualty in the Islamic Jihad against the biblical God and his gospel message. Well we're out of time. Uh, I'd like to mention to our viewers if they have any other questions uh, they contact us. We have free literature on Islam. Uh, we have a newsletter we put out that's free for anyone who wants to leave their phone number, I mean their mailing address. We'll add you to our or mailing email. list. Yeah. Right, email. Uh, and contact us. Uh, we don't do this, this ministry for money. We do it because we love the Lord Jesus Christ and we want others to know the truth about Him. It, it upsets us when we see so many lies about Jesus Christ. We want the truth to be known and that's why we do these things, not for any kind of money or uh, financial compensation. So if you need any information, please contact us and we'll be glad to help you in that regard. Well, uh, we've got to go. Time's up. I'm Larry Wessels with Steve Morrison for Christian Answers. Join us again next time. And remember, Jesus is Lord. Jesus did die for your sins. He did die on a cross. These things aren't forgeries. The evidence is there. You can believe them and put your trust in the Word of God. That's what Jesus said. That's what the prophets say. With that, God bless you all. Join us again next time.